Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And today I am joined by a true New York City kid. She's a self-described juvenile delinquent who evolved into a truly clever businesswoman. She tells her entire story from surviving not only the suburbs of Connecticut, but psych wards and the housewives in her memoir titled Chaos Theory. She's laughing at this intro. (laughs) Hi, Leah Mob, a.k.a. Leah McSweeney. Hi, that was a great intro. Thank you. Thank you. I do pride okay. myself on like writing these to be a bit, you know, good. Le- not bo- not as boring as they could be. How are you today? I'm really good. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. You know, I, I was just telling you before I finished your book in two days, cover to cover. I'm flattered and honored and I thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Now, here's my question for you. So now normally... I'm an audiobook listener. I want to know because this is you're re- in the story in your, in the entire book you're really reliving some of the most intense, sometimes harrowing moments of your life. How was it to actually record the audiobook like reading it out loud? It's so funny that you're asking me this, like not funny but interesting because doing the recording of the audiobook was actually like so gutting and like emotional and like fucked me up. Like it fucked me up where I was like, why, why did I do this? Why am I telling this? I don't want to think about this. And like, I had to call my mom and I talked to my therapist and my sponsor and like, it was uh, a lot. It was like, really like, it made me sad. Like, you know, it, um, not that I, you know, not that it's a sad story, but you know, cause the happy ending is like, I'm alive, you know, and and me and my mom have a relationship and I have a, you know, a great life and a kid and it's amazing. But it it was harder to read it out loud than to write it. I mean, you said that the best part of the book was shooting the cover. Exactly. So. And I I actually really love the cover. Is it true? It was designed by Rob? Yes. So it's a funny story. Um, this is the second, we had two photo shoots cause I wasn't happy with the first one. And the second one I, um, I had had, what did, I think I was like sick or something. And I had a steroid shot cause I have like asthma and stuff. So I had a steroid shot and then I was, so I was up all night and at 5am my makeup, my makeup guy texts me Colby and he's like, I have pink eye and I'm coughing. And I'm like, dude, wear goggles, wear a face shield. We're doing this. Fucking- I haven't slept. I'm, I'm like tweaking out on a steroid shot. I'm like, we're doing this photo shoot and it's going to come out fucking awesome because the first one didn't and we don't have any other chances. This is it. You know, like, like we just did it. And I had a lot of different options and they all came out amazing. But Rob designed the actual like layout and the artwork, you know, he designed all of that. I love that. And you go into like, I mean, I really felt like, I felt like the book was, it was a love letter to New York City, but also it really felt like a love letter to him. (laughs) So funny that you're saying this too, because it really is like a love letter to New York City. You know, like New York is the backdrop of the whole thing. And it's like me wanting to get back there, like right when I'm living in Connecticut and um, raising my daughter here and then being on the show, of New York housewife, you know, but then I do, I mean, Rob should be freaking happy. Right. Because really I, I gave him his flowers, you know, I mean, I, I want to be honest, like it wasn't always easy, you know, but at the end of the day, Rob has been so consistent and like such a positive person for me in my life. Like I could write down some fucked up stories, but why would I do that? I mean, because we all know him a little bit through the show, but I love like a, an outstanding question that I had from just like experiencing you on the show and experiencing him on the show was why didn't you guys ever be- get back together? And you go in. That's like a big part of the book is you you explain you answer that question. So I was like very intrigued by that whole part oh, of it. Oh, yeah. Cool. So always glad that you like incorporated that. Um, all right. I want to. <laughs> this is has nothing to do with anything, but the first thing I want to kind of throw at you is: Can we talk about your Halloween costume from this year, going as Madonna from the '95 oh, VMAs? Thank you. When you were talking, about, I was like, "Oh God, I hope it's not when I had the, you know, when I like called Heather the Karen or whatever." <laughs> no, no, no. I don't care about that. I care about you as Madonna. Madonna. Oh, wasn't it? I got. 
Tell it me, tell, tell me everything. Where did this idea come from? Where did you get that moon man? And how was it that you were able to literally recreate that exact blue satin sexy top? I know. So that was her like Tom Ford Gucci moment when Courtney Love th- is throwing her compact at her when she's up there with um, what's his name from MTV? Kurt Loder. <laughs> or Kurt Loder, of course. Um, you know, it's just always been one of my favorite moments of hers, like fashion wise mm-hmm. and like her up in her hair like I just love that moment also just like not even just for fashion but like that whole moment was iconic of like Courtney Love like throwing the compact at her so I'm like you know what I think I want to be I was going I was like I either want to be Courtney Love or Madonna this year I said that and I'm like I'm gonna go for Madonna and I'll just be you know her from so I got the moon man from and Colby really helped me my makeup artist he's very he's Halloween is like his like you know everything so He helped me find the moon man, which I got on eBay. I, of course, I was looking for the Tom Ford Gucci uh, stuff, maybe to rent it, maybe to buy it secondhand, but it's very hard to find. So I just found a teal colored satin silk shirt that somehow looked very similar. And then I even, if you didn't, I had the mesh bra with the open. (laughs) You literally, I mean, maybe it was the hair, like you, mm-hmm. between you and the makeup artist you literally like embodied her yeah it was i mean madonna's a great person to embody for a night i mean fuck she's so fucking epic you actually met in the book i was i'm a huge madonna fan um she comes up quite a bit on this show and i love you there's a passing reference to the like a prayer video in the book and I and I love that were you I mean I know that your influences are like little Kim and I know that like you're big on Cardi B but like were you like growing up were you a big Madonna fan of course oh my god I yeah absolutely like that she was my everything like when I when I was like I guess seven or something like I can't remember like when CDs came out or like when we bought our first CD player it was like a big deal like I don't know I'm 39 you know so I bought like, or I went to, I don't even know where we went to buy CDs. I can't remember, but I got Madonna. I got Madonna like a prayer. I, we, was it the, is that the album? Yeah. Um, when she has the, her stomach and it's just the jewelry hanging yes. down. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Paula Abdul. Like I loved, I grew up listening to all of that. And like Madonna was one of my early Madonna and believe it or not, Howard Stern was a huge influence on me. Dude. Same. How old are you? I'm so glad. That's hilarious that you're asking me how old I am because I was going to tell you, you and I are mere four weeks apart. My birthday is July 31st. So we're both turning four. I'm going to turn 40 and then four weeks later, you're going to turn 40. So we have all the same references and stuff. Yes. Like like Howard Stern when he was on Channel 4, like I would mm-hmm. see Howard like bedroom and watch it and it was so fucked up and cool and crazy I loved it I'm like he's so outrageous I loved outrageous people that just like you know did their own thing your book actually reminded me a bit I was a huge Artie Lang fan like during his serious years and your book because let, let's face it 70 I would say 70 percent of this book is about the experience of being an addict and an alcoholic it reminded me in parts of already books memoir called too fat to fish have you read that no but you you need to I will I absolutely will it's funny because when I went to set out to write the book it wasn't like I thought I was just gonna write and then when I writing it made me realize how much of being an addict and alcoholic has been a part of my life and I even like stopped smoking weed a few months ago and I'm counting days again. And I'm like really going full force now. I'm like, no weed, no nothing. I'm going, I'm full sober because, um, I think it, it was like, I I realized things like writing the book. All right. I want to hear about where are you, were you on 24th and 8th Avenue in Chelsea? Exactly. Obsessed. Love it. I am mere blocks from where you grew up. And so I grew, I'm from Long Island, so I didn't get to the city. And, you know, I grew up like coming into the city, you know, throughout high school. And then eventually I, I, I moved here. But grow, I think I'm very envious of people who grew up in Manhattan. What was Chelsea like in the 90s? 
Yeah, no, it was amazing. Like, obviously, it was a very gay neighborhood. Like, it still is. It was the gay, like, you know, center of the world. And I just remember seeing a lot of drag queens walking around, you know, like a lot. And it just was like normal or like guys just wearing little like I have this very there are certain images that I like never like get out of my head, you know, and one is like I remember these two guys that were in such great shape, not wearing shirts um, and wearing little denim cut off shorts like you know in the middle of summer and just walking arm in arm you know and I just remember their butts <laughs> like in these like denim shorts like hugging their asses you know and one guy had his like hand on the other guy's like ass cheek and I was like huh um like there's there was a lot of um sex workers everywhere a lot you know and I even talk about I think one in the book the one the woman wearing red mm-hmm. and um she was wearing a red umbrella and she had a red little you know, bra and thongs and red platforms. And she was walking in the rain. And my bus driver used to go down 11th Avenue purposely. So he could like talk to all of them and he had names for all of them. Oh, it was like, yeah, New York was great. Yeah, it was nuts. Like it was just, you know, like, hi, (laughs) like waving from the bus. (laughs) And then I would club kids all the time too. And I wasn't sure what they were. I thought they were clowns at first because Club, club kids. Um, kids, yeah, I remember seeing them wearing platform sneakers this, you know, this big and like walking like this sometimes. And I was like, are they, are those clowns? Like, I don't understand. And then when I got older, I realized like a few years older, I was like, oh, they're club kids. Like, cause I grew up, you know, in between tunnel, limelight, like it was all in Chelsea. It was a very, you know, it was, a, and then I had friends that grew up in the projects that were next to my co-ops, you know? So I had a there, and then I went to school on the Upper East Side and that was a whole other. So I got like so much culture. Like I got so much culture. Like I'm very lucky. So did this, so did seeing sort of like the club kid aesthetic mixed with the street, you know, mixed with the like the sex worker aesthetic, plus the Upper East Side sort of prep school vibe, is did that all inform your personal style and look as a teen? One hundred percent, absolutely. So, like, what did you what did you grab? Like, give me like an example of like your favorite outfit at the time that you like stole or inspired oh. from various pieces. So I had these Todd Oldham laminated jeans that I loved. I don't know where I got them. Like, I can't even tell you. And then I would wear like, I really loved sheer everything. I still do. But um, it was like a button, button up, but like short sleeve shirt that was like kind of tight, you know, a sheer like maybe purple shirt that I would wear with that. And then maybe some like, I had these purple shiny airwalk sneakers that I loved, but I also had you know, John Fluvog, like shoes that I loved. And then there was this vintage store, Smile on Nylon, and I had shoes from there too that I really, I wore a lot. Um, fat, like baby fat, I wore baby fat back then too, like little tees, little baby tees. How did you know Pat Field, who like, listen, we all know who Patricia Field is. How did you knew her partner at the time? No, so I, when I started styling, I started working with Rebecca Weinberg, who's Pat, that was Pat Field's ex-wife. She was Rebecca Field. Like she, you know, but I, I can't remember how I got in touch with her. This was in early 2000s, like maybe in 2000 or 2001 or 2002. I don't remember. I probably like found her website and emailed her or called her, or I don't know how we did things back then even, but it, that's how I'm sure that's how I did it. Like I was like, like hungry and looking for work, you know? Wow. And so this is while, were they still together or no? They weren't still together. Oh, okay. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so you were going to prep school. Uh, you were going to Sacred Heart. And you say that some of your classmates were Nikki Hilton and Gaga. Now, obviously, they're not exactly your age. So did you even know them? No. Yeah, I yeah, figured. I think, like they were the classmates like they were uh in the school you know what I mean like those were some of the the names that were there you said that your expulsion like you go into great detail sort of like how the headmistress kind of like called you in and your mom and that this was a defining moment in your life that you're still 
reeling from even it kind of like set you on the path for the rest of your life in a way. I think so. And I think that, um, you know, being rejected like that, like from a place you already felt kind of like not as good enough or not pretty enough or not rich enough or whatever it was. And maybe, like I said in the book too, a lot of girls, maybe it was like, maybe it was in my head. I mean, because it, it was in my head because I don't think any of the girls were thinking that about me, you know, like I had very nice classmates. I'm still friends with like all of them, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them. So it wasn't like that, but I just felt, I internalized a lot of it. You know, I internalized a lot of that. You said, you say how how the movie kids was highly influential, obviously for our generation, I guess like the modern. Sadly it was, it shouldn't be. It's like the like, you know, cautionary tale, but. it So it made me want it because obviously that was a defining movie of our generation are you watching euphoria no i can't it's too hard for me to watch because i feel like euphoria is the 2022 version of what kids was i i have yeah i have a 14 year old i had a hard adolescence i don't want to watch teenagers do drugs and have sex and i just i i tried watching it year a couple years ago i guess when it first came out and i was like Nope, can't do it. Maybe I'll try again because everybody like loves it so much and I get it. That's a really good TV show, but I just, I'll I'll try it out again because I hear amazing things about it, but I can watch murder. I can watch everything. But when it comes to like teenagers, like, you know, like fucking their lives up and doing drugs and stuff, it just, I don't know. It's hard. No, I completely, listen, if I had it, I, I actually have a friend who just had, a baby like he and his partner just adopted literally this child is like two weeks old and he's like I can't watch that show he's like I need to just watch this child until the kid is 20 (laughs) that's funny makes sense you 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 have a quote in the book how doing drugs became your identity how did that happen You know, I think like when you get labeled, like I felt like that was my way of, well, I think when you're a drug addict and you're doing a lot of drugs, it just becomes a part of who you are, you know? And I think that, look, I got thrown out of Sacred Heart. I then felt like I'm bad. I'm not worthy. You know, I don't deserve good things. And then I think I just created that for myself. It was like a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was also not a child actor, but I was like in, I was, I belonged to this group called the city kids, um, which was a acting like conservatory group, like that Donald Faison was in when I was there. And I was like really into it. I loved theater and I loved singing. And then when I got thrown out of school, when we moved to Connecticut, I was like, I'm not joining this stupid freaking, I don't want to do theater here. I was like doing an off-Broadway play in New York. Like, you know, so I think that like everything got taken away from me that I had identified with. And when you're a teenager, you know, that's everything is your identity and like your clothes and your friends and, you know, you're by figuring out who you are Mm -hmm. and all of that I knew was done. So I felt like I was in outer space just floating around trying to find something, you know, and I found raves and I found drugs. So I was like clinging on to it for dear life once I found it. And that was because I I mean, it's clear to me now that you found that stuff because or it, obviously it was like an extreme reaction after you were expelled from Sacred Heart. Your parents, I mean, obviously, it's quite expensive to live in the city. They wound up buying a house in Connecticut and put you, your sister, your brother in the car, and you guys, what, had no idea that you were moving? We knew we were moving, but we had no idea what the house looked like. We had no Mm -hmm. idea what the town was. We'd never been there before. Like, it was crazy. Like, it was the first time seeing it. And I was like, oh my God, this looks like a haunted barn. Like, no, I was like, I'm living in a bad dream. We like pulled into the town and my dad's like, there's the flagpole. I'm like, the fucking flagpole like I used to be able to see the entire state building from our balcony like I'm looking at a flagpole and then he's like and here's the 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 town hall that has two dollar movies and I was like this is supposed to sound good you know so now I think my parents house is so beautiful but 
like I said, I really felt like I lost everything. And my parents, even though my mother is a therapist and, you know, everything they, I have to say, I just don't think that they, and I've talked about this with my mom a million times. I don't think that they, she claims that she tried. It was never going to, I was always going to end up doing drugs anyway. And I should have joined the, the town theater or whatever, like the school theater. I, I joined the track team at one point, but you know, she's just like, you just didn't make the best of it. You made the worst of it. But at the same time, I felt like no one cared about my feelings or what I was going through. And so I was like, I'm just going to get high. It seems like you were quite explicit with them. Like, yeah, mom, I did acid last night. Like it didn't seem like you were trying to hide it from them. Yeah, I really wasn't. Like I did tell her like, well, I tried that one, that first time I did acid, I did like hide that I went to the rave. But then my friend left her tickets for the rave in her freaking pocketbook or in her pants or whatever. And the, the dad found them and called my mom. And so my mom's like, I know you weren't even home all night. And I was like, okay, well, I also did like acid and speed. And she was like, <laughs> and I'm like, whatever. Um, I still have the ticket. That's <laughs> amazing. I have it. From what I understand, the first time they picked you up and were like, you're checking into rehab. But after that, it reached a point and then you eventually got out. You resumed, I think you resumed school, but then eventually you hit a point where you realized you were an addict and you sort of had the, I want to kind of understand, like, how did you eventually have the agency to understand A, that you were an addict and B, to take the initiative that I need to go back to rehab. Like how old were you and how did you arrive at that conclusion? Um, that at that point I was, there were a few, there was a few rehabs, you know, I mean, the first one I even at the rehab though, when they were explaining what addiction was and like, I was like, Oh wow, that's crazy. I think I have that. Mm -hmm. So I knew it. I was like, mm, yeah, I have that in my brain. There's no red light. It's just a green light. And that's exactly how they described it. And I was like, yeah, that's me. But who's getting sober at age 15? I didn't have the, you know, and plus I was like having too much fun and I was in too much pain to face, you know, my life. Like I, I there in Connecticut and the third one I did, I said, I need to get, get help, you know? And, um, I guess I arrived to that point because I was 18. I had just graduated. That was in 2000. I was 17 or 18. And I, all my friends went to college and I was still at my parents' house. And I was like, just drinking so much and like going into the city and like smoking angel dust and just like not doing anything. And I was like, and all my friends were doing things. Not, I mean, some of my friends were like total crackheads and weren't doing things, but my best friends, they like were able to like par have do drugs sometimes and like not keep going for days, you know, like I was different than them. And I think it really was just the most sad. Like, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like I need to change shit up. Like I can't sit here and like just get high and drink all day. Can you kind of walk me through what, what is rehab like? Like the, if, you, if you're there for say three days, whatever it is, can you kind of summarize, like paint the picture for me? So this third time that I went to rehab, I went to Karen Foundation, which is like, I had gone there when I was 15. So rehab, I mean, it looks, it's been a while since I've been there, but um, it's basically group therapy. You know, it's individual therapy. It's AA meetings that they take you sometimes off campus or sometimes say, then it's activities, you know, like I'm lucky that was a really nice kind of place too. And we went rock climbing and I stayed for 90 days. I stayed for three months. So I was in like an extended care program. Um, you know, if you're in school, cause it was in the adolescence unit, you do like your schoolwork or whatever, you know, and you just try to heal basically. And then flashing forward years later, you wound up in like a psychiatric ward. Can you, you're laughing at that too. I'm spitting out my water because I'm like, yes. And then that happened. Too. I mean, listen, this is a, this is your life. So it's life. It's life. life is, you know, crazy. Life is not, um, you know, my life's not boring. That's for sure. So I, what led up to, having to go into, I mean, it sounds like you checked yourself into the psych ward. What led, what led up to that? And then also paint the picture 
of being in a psych ward? So this psych ward was pretty gnarly. Um, it was like, in, it's in New York. It's on the Upper East Side. So I had um, gotten into a really toxic relationship while I was sober. And I got into a relationship with an active alcoholic, which was actually, I should have just started drinking. That would have been better for me than dating an alcoholic and trying to get him sober. Um, it was like just uh, three years on and off of just like total insanity, like crazy, crazy. I'm not going to blow his spot up completely, but we went on a vacation, which was dumb of me. You know, he only had like a month sober or something. And he's like, let's go to Italy, like for our birthdays. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be great. And then like a couple days go by and I realized that he's like wasted, like he's wasted. Like, I'm like, what the hell he's been drinking? And I didn't even know it. I ha- oh, it was the most dramatic thing. We had to have the Airbnb people come. I slapped him in the face and then book a flight the next day. And I left. And when I got back, I was just so empty and tired and like, couldn't go on. Like, I was like, I just need to go somewhere like, and in, uh, not a spa, you know? And it just so happened that my friend's husband was on the board of this hospital and could get me in and quickly and whatever. And it was, a it was the, a really great experience because I met a doctor who took me off a lot of psych meds that I had been on that I shouldn't have been on. Nothing wrong with meds, but if they're not working for you well, then then you shouldn't be on them, you know? And also I really realized that there were a lot of, a lot of things were in my control. Some things aren't in my control. I, I do have clinical depression and anxiety and all those things, but I'm the one who decided to date an active alcoholic who was a total fucking mess and decided to go to Italy with him. So, you know, I'm like, wow, I can, there are some people here in this hospital who do not understand reality from delusion. And I'm lucky that I do. And now I need to make healthier decisions for myself. So it was a very empowering thing. Like, guess what? You don't want to fucking like get disappointed or feel heartbroken or whatever, get driven crazy. Don't date a toxic person. Like it's really easy. But but how does this equate to going to a psych ward? Like you can get that from therapy. I, but I, I did never did when, I don't know. It was something about being in the hospital and being there and seeing other people Mm -hmm. who, you know, I wasn't suicidal or anything like that. Like, you know, um, something about seeing the other patients and being in that setting. Like I was like, okay, like I can, there are things that are in my control that I can do and I need to start making better decisions for myself or I'm going to end up like continuing to end up in psych wards and I'm sober and it's not cool. All right. Let's lighten it up a little bit. Let's, let's change oh, thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, yeah. Anything else? Like no, no I think everything. I think we're done with the girl interrupted portion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to move. It's like that, but yes, it was Let's or move. it wasn't like that. So I just just really quickly because this reminds me in rehab. I remember my roommate. I had to change rooms because she was bulimic and she was throwing up all over our shower, and I was like. And not like cleaning it and I couldn't do it anymore. And I was just like, I need to move. I need to like, it's, it's intense. It's like the, the rehab was a lot more intense than the psych ward. Cause I had my own room at the psych ward, you know? So Gracie square is what it's called. Um, but the, but rehab was a little more, plus you're there for 90 days, like, you know, so mm-hmm. and girls are cutting and, you know, they're doing all that shit there too, you know? All right. So let's lighten it up. So, the day, <laughs> so growing up in Chelsea, being exposed to sort of all of this early, sec- early um, different expressions of sexuality, how do you, like, how do you identify? I mean, I'm not really having any sex right now, but, you know, but I don't, I just like don't identify. <laughs> like, I'm like, like, I mean, I've, you know, been with women, you know, but normally it's not like, I think I like men. I, more than women sexually but at the right now I don't like anyone sexually actually like your earliest like sexual experiences were with like girls was that at Sacred Heart or like oh, like in Connecticut at the high no, school that was, it was in the city but it was in high school it was in like ninth grade I think ninth grade or tenth grade I, my parents read about it in my diary 
Yeah, I don't know. I guess I didn't add that into the book. Yeah, the the um, rehab counselor said look through her diary to find out how many, how what, how much drugs and you know and drinking she's doing. And then they read all about my threesome with my two friends, and it talks explicitly about what we all did to each other. And my father and mother read it. What did they say? They said we know what you did with so and so and so and so. And I was like. <laughs> like what? Like, ugh. and you also you dated a married couple. I did. How was that? That was pretty intense. Um, I think talk, I was talk to me about that. Yeah, that was well. So I actually kind of liked the woman, right? But she had a she had her husband boyfriend guy. So she was like, oh, I can't really like, there was like a connection with us. Like it was emotional. Like, look, women don't, I think if more, like, I think if I had women like hitting on me or like asking me out on a date, I would do it like, and I'd be open, but I just don't have that. So I, and I'm not going after it, you know, but with her, you know, it was a very immediate kind of, she was like flirting with me and stuff and she's beautiful. Um, and I think I was maybe hypomanic at the time. <laughs> You know, I was just very horny, like a very horny person. Like, it's, I'm just not now, you know? And for whatever reason, I was just extremely horny this summer, this one summer. I mean, actually, it was for years I was very horny. And I'm, I don't know if it was like a primal, you know, sex is such a, I don't want to say it's like low vibration shit, but it kind of can be. And I think I wasn't at the best point in my life during those years. So I was seeking that kind of external pleasure and maybe I'm not right now because I feel pretty decent, you know, and I don't need that distraction. But but it was fun. It didn't last that long because it was just too intense. Like, I don't want to be in a throuple, you know, mm -hmm. like I was like, would you would you ever be in a would you ever be in a relationship with a woman? Like, suppose that woman didn't have the guy attached. Like, is that something you'd be open to? Like, if you if there was that connection? I think so. Like, I think I would be, but like, again, it's just, I haven't had a relationship. I mean, I've had sex with women, but I haven't had like a relationship with a woman. So, but I, my friend um, was married to a woman who's had sex with plenty of guys. You know, I kind of asked her, like, maybe I could be with a woman. I don't know. She was, I just feel like I can be myself more than I can be in front of a man. And I'm like, God, I totally identify with that. Like, honestly, Leah. It's a nightmare. Don't bother. You're lucky. Go. No, you don't. You don't want it. It is a nightmare. It'll drive you You're back. Really to, it'll drive you back back to the psych ward. Skip it. Okay. I guess. All right. I'll just stay non date. I mean, I'm just not dating and I'm not having sex and I'm happy like with that. It's just it's just so much, you know, and I have things to do. I have other things to do. You sort of speak to how you don't subscribe to the societal pressures of needing to be in a relationship and and I wonder if perhaps that's because you already have a, a kid and like most people are driven to be in relationships because they want to have a kid exactly I'm very lucky in that in that way that I have my daughter early her dad's cool you know obviously more than cool we're like great friends I'm in a like lucky position but I do have people who are like, but don't you still want to be in a relationship? Don't, don't you feel like that's missing? I'm like, I don't really feel like anything's missing. Tell me what you meant by sex being a low vibration thing. What does that mean? I know that sounds like bad. I don't know. Just like for me at that time, it was a low vibration thing. Like, I don't know. It wasn't great for my spirit. I don't mm. think like when I was doing that, that's why, you know? Yeah. And it's also just like primal shit. Like that's why like that attraction goes away with couples, you know, and then you build something deeper. So it's just like, it's a very base like instinct, you know? What else were you? So, okay. So we talked about like you love Madonna and Howard Stern. What else were you into? I mean, like, I know, I mean, so imagine it's the year is, let's say 1999. I know you're a huge Britney fan. Like, why was it Britney over Christina for you? There's not even a comparison. Like, I mean, I love Christina, but there's just not, it's totally different. Like, like Britney has given us, first of all, her music. You know, and look, Christina's voice is so powerful, you know, but 
Britney just seemed like more relatable or something. She was just Britney Spears. Like I just don't even think there's a comparison with her and Christina. I really don't, you know? And then, and of course, as I got older and as we got older, me and her, her and all of us and just seeing how down to earth and how she was just this girl could afford anything in the world she's not out there buying bags you know you like well, her um old assistant said she was hand she wanted to give people money and stuff she's just her heart is solid gold that girl you could tell totally so humble i mean so humble and down to earth like a true louisiana girl like us exactly how do we think she's doing now though what do you think um honestly the instagram is very true like anybody that's like being honest about it like if you're reading those those like here okay here's here's the truth of what i think and i don't know why anybody's not talking about this her whole life she was overly sexualized from a young age and then she was put in this conservatorship where everything was controlled like her image the music the tours everything now that she's finally free She's doing the same thing, posting photos of her bot. It's still this over-sexualization. So there's something, she's pro, there's- she is programmed to, that this is her worth. Yeah. I'm worried. I mean, I pray that she's, uh, you know, that she's going to end up okay. Like, what, what is your take? Like, what did you, like, when you read the captions or see the photos that she's posting, I mean, what do you think of the boyfriend? <laughs> Right. I'm just like, who's around her? That's really, has anyone ever been around her that's in her corner that actually like is protecting her? I don't know. I really don't know. And that's scary. And also someone that's been through so much fucking trauma, so much. I can't even imagine. I mean, literally like season 13 of Roni fucked me up in the head. I can't imagine what it's like being Britney Spears. That's a million times harder. And like, just that documentary that we all saw, like, and we all, like, Diane Sawyer and fucking um, Matt Lauer and, like, you know, all these people, like, coming at her and judging her and being so harsh on her and being a new mom and having to deal postpartum and everything and, like, having mental health issues and having people laugh at it. And I can't imagine how she, she has so much healing to do. And is it happening? I hope. Yeah, I guess since you brought up season 13, like how how did it affect you? I mean, look, I like I was like mourning my grandmother that whole time and having to film and try to seem like I wasn't depressed. And I was really just not well. I was depressed. I was really I was having so much anxiety. I even like during the season tried to go on like Wellbutrin, like I added Wellbutrin to my Lexapro, but it wasn't like a storyline. You know what I mean? Like I just did it and didn't like talk I mean not like I actually would talk about it but it just didn't end up you know on the show it wasn't something they wanted to follow Mm -hmm. but that was rough because then I was like oh my god it's not working you know and I'm still depressed and then I had to quarantine like multiple times because I kept getting exposed for some reason so I would have to stay in my apartment for two weeks at a time and not leave and like deal with depression and anxiety at the same time so you know that trip and also the other thing is like it just got off to a bad start for me because like what was a four day trip or like three days for me turned into a literally five week, five weeks. It's like, why is Leah still in a bad mood? Why is she still talking about her grandmother? Why doesn't she leave? Cause it seemed like it was like five weeks long, but it was only three, four days for me, you know? So it just sucked all around COVID, you know, but uh, it, it also helped me build a tougher skin. And I'm always grateful for things that I go through that are difficult because you always learn something and come out better for it. I thought it was very interesting how you said, I don't remember which of the women did it, but after the Newport trip, your first season, maybe it was Sonia and Ramona. I don't really remember who, but they went to Bravo and said that they were concerned about you and Bravo hooked you up with a therapist. Is this a therapist that Bravo has at their disposal for some of their talent? I don't know. Cause it's only someone I talked to once, oh. you know, it's not like I need a therapist or anything. It's just a psychiatrist that like, you know, I think it's kind of also like a liability thing. Like check in, like, you know, like see like if there's cast members making accusations, like, 
or whatever. I mean, I, that was so dumb because honestly, I should have been talking to the psychiatrist in season 13, not season 12. I was actually kind of having fun season 12. Um, you know, but that was because they just, they like hated, they just, because I was fighting with both of them. They wanted me fired. They wanted me fired. They weren't really concerned about me. You know, I just tried to get me nice in the book, I think, but that's mm -hmm. the reality. I, I don't think they were actually concerned because they get drunk all the time. Um, you tell your origin story is pretty interesting, sort of how you wound up on the housewives. Like I, we all know that like you were sort of in a roundabout way referred by Bethany through to you. You have this, you share this facialist and eventually a producer like slid in your DMS and that's how they made contact with you. They yeah. come over to your apartment and they sit down and they kind of interview you and they asked your thoughts on the show. What were your thoughts on the show? So I hadn't been watching New York in a, maybe five years or something. Like, I feel like I watched the last season I watched was like Luann and Tom mm -hmm. um, when like he was cheating on her or whatever. Great it, season. It was pretty amazing television, but I did watch um, like Jersey and Beverly Hills. So when they, they asked me about the women, you know, I don't even remember what I said. I mean, I probably, this is the thing, like everyone surprised me once I met them, you know, you think one thing and then you meet them and it's different, you know, like I didn't have strong feelings one way or the other about them, you know. Did you tell the producers like basically your entire story, like your whole history with alcohol and addiction? Like, did you share all of that, that, that you had been sober, but you're recently not well, sober? I, I told them that I was recently not sober again. Yes. And that, you know, I had it under control and, you know, all that. But did, did they know basically the whole, everything that's in the book? I'm like, it, no, they didn't know any of that. Wow. Yeah. No, why would I tell them my whole, you know, I mean, I told them I've been sober for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. Maybe I kind of threw in the sacred heart thing. I mean, you know, I didn't, but I didn't give them my whole life story. Like, it's not like you have that much time, you know, more asking about recent stuff, you know, like, what do I do day to day? Like, am I dating anyone? You know, that kind of shit. Like I told them my relationship with Rob, you know, mm -hmm. all that. did you ever get to like thank Bethany or like connect with her because she was supposed to be on your season with you I think people what? I think people forget that she you guys were supposed to be on together what was your reaction when you found out that suddenly I mean yeah like, what was your reaction I was shocked I was totally shocked like I was like what like I thought like me and her were gonna be friends on the show or whatever like she's the one that you know, hooked me up or said or my name or whatever it was. Um, I haven't gotten to thank her. I tried to reach out like through our facialist and she didn't want to talk to me. So why? I don't know. Maybe she's just done with the show and done with everything. So, wow. Yeah. But I sent her flowers and a thank you card. Very nice. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Um, you know, I was quite, struck by that um that not all diamonds and rosé book the way oh. not, yeah you know what I'm talking about like I mean you you took part in the book you were so kind to your entire cat you literally did not say a negative word and you're also incredibly kind in the book and then on the flip side they just tore everyone down, like in, speaking negatively about you and your sister. What did you think reading that? I was disgusted. I was disgusted. Like, what kind of woman does that? What kind of woman does that? Someone with no integrity. And I was disgusted about what Heather said about Sonia, but I was also disgusted about what Sonia said about me and my sister and Tinsley, especially because I was always like a defender of Sonia, you know, and things like that. So, and um, I was hurt. I was really hurt and I was disgusted, but I was also like, okay, that kind of shows me who these people are, you know? Are you relieved to kind of, I mean, who knows what's going to happen I mean, we kind of know what's going to happen, but that article also said absolutely nothing. I made a joke. I was like, it was like 4,000 words and it literally said nothing. Are you just at this point, 
do you feel a sense of relief to just like have your book out there and like the future is yours, however you want it to be? Like, how are you feeling today? I feel great. I feel grounded. Um, I feel like I don't need to worry about things that the universe takes care of them for me. I mean, look, I've, I've enjoyed, like, I enjoy being on the show. I've enjoyed working with like Andy and everybody and you know, the future, we have to see what happens. I think my groceries just got here. I'm oh, sorry. Can you hold on? One of second? course. Yeah. <laughs> like I feel like very calm, I'm confident in the network and, you know, shed media and they'll make the right decision and the best decision when the time comes. But right now I'm not really thinking about that. I have the book and yeah. I just know the right thing will happen. That's supposed to happen. Speaking of Bravo, two questions that are somewhat unrelated, but I just want to I just want to throw it out there. Number one, since you did go to Sacred Heart and you've experienced in like the New York City uh, private school system, did you watch NYC Prep? You know what? I I kind of remember when it came out. I don't fully remember if I watched it or not. If I did, it, I don't remember. Go back and watch it. I watch it. Yeah, you should watch okay. it. It's okay. like eight. Ep- it's eight episodes, and it like has some. Mo- I mean, it is like these kids have obviously like no media training. Like they're so they're like, young. Are they like monsters? Are they like monsters? <laughs> are they monsters? Um, monsters in the making. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of them are nice. I watched it a little. I watched it like last year. I remember being like, I had like zero expectations and I was, I wound up getting like really sucked into it because I, oh, cool. I didn't, you know, I went to public school on Long Island. So like I, it's a world that I don't really have access to. So I just found it quite interesting. Um, so that was number, that was number one. Number two, I know you're friends with Kelly Catrone. Mm-hmm. How did you meet, like obviously she has her own fashion thing or her own like PR company how did the two of you connect? So it's funny because her longtime assistant uh, loves Married to the Mob. So Kelly was aware of the brand. Now, the funny thing is when I was working for Rebecca Weinberg and other stylists, I would have to go to People's Revolution to pull clothing and stuff and would see Kelly there. And like, I mean, I like I think Kelly's the coolest fucking bitch ever, you know, but she also can be terrifying if you don't know her. But... Um, <laughs> Our a mutual friend put us in touch a, a couple years ago and it was like soul family. Like that woman is like, we're going to be in each other's lives forever. She's everything. She's amazing. I'm surprised that they never poached her. I mean, I, I know she had her show Kel on Earth. I'm surprised they didn't fit her into Housewives at some point. Well, I think last season it was just too hard to do it because of COVID. There was nothing to do. Oh, oh you she- mean to to put her as a as a housewife or just yeah. like in some way. Yeah. Well, I was I mean, thinking I was thinking a housewife, but I guess she could have come on with you as a friend. Yeah, we were going to ice skate together, but then there was like all these covid rules. It was hard to do anything. We can because she's an ice skater. She like grew up skating. She's a really good ice skater and I'm an adult ice skater. I started as an adult. But when she was young, she was ice skating. So Maybe maybe next season, whenever that happens. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I had no idea the ice skating connection. I guess my my final question would be, how did you ultimately, you appearing regularly, you know, week after week on the show, how did that affect Married to the Mob? Like, did it skyrocket sales? Yeah, it did. It, it helps, you know, but it's still... I mean, I still have to work at it. <laughs> you know, it's not just like an automatic, like, boom, you're on the show, sales go up. Like, it's still work, you know, but it definitely helped for sure. And Happy Place, too, the, my road brand, you yeah. know, platform. even if this, even if the views were low last season, it's still a big platform. I'm sure. I mean, what do you want the biggest takeaway? People who read Chaos Theory, I, oh, by the way, the title, did you come up with the title? Mm hmm. I love it. Can you like quickly, quickly state like what does chaos theory mean? Like the actual like mathematical like. Yeah. Like why did you why did you choose that for the title? Because like the actual chaos theory, you know, there is an order to my mess, you know, and it's like you can just you can tie that into life so much like. 
a butterfly flapping its wings and causing a fucking hurricane somewhere or a storm somewhere, you know, like one little movement in your life and like everything changes and you don't know what's next, you know? So that's why. I love that. Leah, thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great interview. You're very good at your job. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye.